theme is greater things to be done in 2021 and uh, we've been focusing on that just this last week and this week and we're going to focus on it for the month and uh, the greater things to be done uh, we're picking up what jesus said he said i tell you the truth anyone who has faith in me will do what i have been doing and he will do even greater things than these because i am going to the father we, we noticed last time that jesus was referencing that the church will do greater things and uh Every now and then you'll see me push that tooth back up, okay. You, know, you guys know what's going on here. But uh, greater things that he's going to do. Last time we talked about the greater outreach that took place in the church because Jesus had promised. When you think about greater outreach, it came through preaching. That greater outreach came through conviction. It's like on the day of Pentecost, something happened because the Holy Spirit was given to the, the, the apostles that when they preached, there was such power and authority. Their other preaching, they never got the response. The whole earthly ministry of Jesus. Jesus was preaching, they were preaching, and, and as he sent them out and they preached all over uh, the, the land, he split them up and sent them out by twos. Nothing happened quite like what happened on the day of Pentecost. When they preached, the people were convicted, and they were convicted deeply inside, and he challenged them he said, repent, turn around, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, really because of the forgiveness of sins that is found in Jesus Christ. Because they asked, what must we do? It was all in fulfillment, we saw last time, to Jesus' words, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. They had received the power of the Holy Spirit and when they were preaching, they were preaching with power and authority. That's when they said, what shall we do? And P Peter was preaching. He says, save yourself from this corrupt generation. They were corrupt in many ways, just as our, our, our generation is corrupt in many ways. And I, I could begin cataloging all the ways, but I don't think that's necessary. I think you know exactly how corrupt our generation is. Uh, in political world, I don't know that, that you can be a politician without being corrupt today. That's the way I look at it. Everyone seems to be corrupt. It was that way in Peter's day, only it was a religious group that was just as corrupt as the political group. That was a sad day, sad day. And he began warning, save yourself from them. Why? Because they will be judged. So, so what you need is the salvation of the Lord. And so as many as received the message, as many as received the message, they accepted Christ as their Savior, their Lord. They were baptized, and there was added unto them 3,000 souls that day. That was more that came to them on that one day than the number that came to Jesus in his three-year ministry. He said, greater things will be done. He said that. And they were through outreach. Besides that greater outreach, there was also greater devotion. Think about these disciples. Prior to Pentecost, they were all turning away. Jesus was preaching and he said, I am the bread of life. We're going to explore that more later in the sermon series. I am the bread of life. And saying that, he said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it turned them so off completely, the crowd was leaving. And we can't, we can't believe this. We can't take this. He turned to the, the 12 and he says, will you also go away? I find that very fascinating. The only book of the Bible that has six chapters and 66 verses in it, 666, they turn away. The crowd left. There was a departure. They fled from him. So Jesus turns to the twelve and said, Will you also, are you also going to leave? To which they said, Where will we go? For you have the words of eternal life. Prior to Pentecost, they were powerless. When Jesus was crucified, 
Back up even before that, in the Garden of Gethsemane. They come to grab Jesus. Peter whips out his sword. You remember that? He chops off Malchus, the high priest's servant's ear. And when he does that, Jesus said, put away your sword. He picks up the ear and he heals him. And he says, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And he voluntarily let them take him away. What happened to the disciples? They scattered. They scattered. He was all alone. On the cross, the only one that showed up there is the, the disciples was John. And he says to John, hey, behold your mother, referring to Mary. What he's saying is, I have no insurance plan. You're going to cover her now. You're going to take care of her. He says, remember, remember your mother. Look to your mother. Your mother, look to, look to your son. The only one there, they all scattered and left. What happened after Jesus rose from the dead? Oh, they were all so excited. They saw Jesus alive as they met in the upper room. But what, what happens? As soon as Jesus is not around, Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. Jesus has to go to the seashore, and he, he's got to catch a fish while they're out on land, and finally they recognize it's Jesus. They come, and they have a meal with him. Why? They were always scattering, scattering. The Holy Spirit comes to them on the day of Pentecost. After Pentecost, everything changes. There's 3,000 people except Christ on that day, and the church begins, and we have at this church an incredible start. They had greater devotion. I want to pick up in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to pick up at verse 42, they devoted themselves. Now the question is, what is devotion? So I looked it up. I looked it up in the Greek lexicon because this passage is written in Greek. In the Greek lexicon, it tells us the first, first idea is when you're devoted, you're attached. You attach yourself to, you wait on, you're faithful to. I liken that to joining the church. <laughs> when they devoted themselves to the cause, they joined the cause. They were involved in the cause. I find it interesting that people will attend and attend and attend and not join the church. But they go to Costco one time with a friend and they join. Did you notice that? Or they go to Sam's Club one time with a friend and they join. Or, or you know, uh, there's a golf, you got a sub one time, next thing you know they want to join. Bowling league, hey, oh, they bowl one time as a replacement, they want to join. Or whatever it is, very willing to join. Devotion is more than attending. Devotion is actually attaching oneself to, waiting on and being faithful to that which you are joining. They join the church. The second thing in the definition I found was they busied themselves with one, uh, busied themselves with and were busily engaged in. They were volunteering. They said, well, you know what? It's not enough to sit in the pew. I've got to be a part of this. I've joined it. I'm going to get involved. I've got to find my niche. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to be a part of the team. When they asked for volunteers, the hands went up. We don't ask for volunteers anymore. You know why? We asked for a volunteer, and all the hands stay down. But if we go to you and we have to look you right in the face, right, eyeball to eyeball, and say, would you do this, we find you're very much more cooperative. I don't know why that is, but in the early church, they were volunteering. They wanted to be a part. They got engaged. This is my church. They were devoted. Rather than scattering and fleeing, they were devoted, busily engaged. Third thing is they hold fast. I got an anchor here. They threw their anchor in. They're holding fast. They continued or persevered in the things that they had devoted themselves to. Now, we're finding in the political world who is devoted to who? Who is persevering with who? Who is abandoning whose cause? Who's joining another cause? The sands are shifting. Not so at the early church. If you continue in the book of Acts, you're going to find when the persecutions broke out, the more they held fast, and the more they held fast, the stronger and greater and more powerful the church became. 
I do believe the church is going to begin suffering persecution in the near future. I believe that. It's in the political winds. I don't know if you're aware, but this week, all the social media has taken the liberty to censor the President of the United States of America. If they can censor him, who will they censor next? Is the gospel message that swears our allegiance to Jesus Christ and not to the, the government or any political party? Are they to be censored next? The Jewish community is already warning Christians you will be persecuted because we hold to biblical values that do not line up with the values of the world. And in an age of suppressing and being intolerant, we will be persecuted. That's when we'll find out the genuine Christian from the, the, the fake. For those that are convenient-oriented Christian and those who would say, I will give my life. I will take up my cross and follow you. They hold fast. That's devotion. They hold fast. The final one is they spent much time together. As we read down in the passage, we're going to see they met every single day. I don't know if I could prepare that many sermons for you. It takes a while just to put all these slides together, so I got coordinated pictures and everything, uh, and uh, to try to engage the visual learning generation. And, uh, but they were meeting every single day, daily. And you know what was happening? People were coming to Jesus Christ every single day. I was thrilled last week to start the service with a baptism. We kicked off the year of celebrating here and worship with a baptism. And I was thrilled that it was a young 8, 10-year-old. Why? Because that represents the future of the church. The future of the church. That's greater devotion. Greater devotion than the disciples during his ministry, Jesus' ministry. He said in Gethsemane, hey, you guys, watch and pray while I go over yonder and pray. Jesus goes over, comes back, they're, they're asleep. Kicks them once or twice. Come on, what's wrong with you guys? You're supposed to be praying. He goes back, prays. You know this happens over and over. The devotion level I think at the beginning of the Church of Acts, no one was sleeping on the job. They were fully devoted to Jesus Christ. They were devoted, now that I get, got through the introduction, you say, Pastor, every week your introductions are getting longer and longer. They were devoted to teaching. My ministry is I'm a pastor teacher. I teach the Word of God. I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will work and stir within you, that the Word of God will make application in your life, in the nitty-gritty details of your life. They just devoted themselves in all those ways, persevering, hanging in there, you know, joining to the apostles' teaching. What did they teach? They taught the Bible. They taught the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he came into the world, for a purpose to go to the cross, to die on the cross, to be buried, and then be raised from the dead, and then ascend again to heaven. And he's going to return once again. They were teaching this. Now, some of the early teachings are called, one is called the Didache, and I was going to present part of that, but it is 15, 16 chapters long. But I made a bunch of slides, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to expound on that. But I, I thought, I'll expound on the one that you do know. It's called the Apostles' Creed. First, first date that I'm aware of is around 309 A.D. And it starts like this. It's a Trinitarian statement. I believe in God the Father. Wow. God is the Father. My Father. Jesus told us to pray that way. Our Father, which art in heaven. I have a relationship with the true and living God. Now, he wants 
wants to qualify which, which father God he's talking about. He's almighty. That means he's infinite, infinite in power. We call that omnipotent. He's infinite in knowledge, omniscient. He's infinite in duration. We call that eternal. He is God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You cannot be a Christian and not believe that, that God is the creator. That's foundational to our faith. I challenge anyone who says they're a Christian and they believe in evolution. Are you kidding me? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created. It doesn't say God started the evolutionary process. God created. The apostles created. Let's, let's boil this down to what really matters, what the apostles, what mattered to them. They start out with God. Second, they start out with Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, we call that the only begotten Son, comes from John chapter 3, verse 16. It's also in the Bible. It's monogenes in Greek. One generation, only generated one. It's an interesting term. That term, only begotten. It has to do with a relationship of uniqueness. Uniqueness. If he's the only begotten of God, which it says one place in the scripture, then he is God. The whole idea. Now, Isaac in the Old Testament was called, according to Hebrews, the only begotten according to the promise. But Ishmael was his older brother. So how could he be the only begotten if he had an older brother? because it doesn't have to do with anything other than he was uniquely the one that God had promised according to the covenant he made with Abraham. Through him will all the blessings come. And so to say that Isaac was the only begotten, it's only begotten according to the promise of God when it says that he is the only begotten who was, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, the only begotten one, he is the one who is uniquely God, the second person of the Trinity. Our Lord, now he's talking about Jesus and his humanity, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, his human nature. We just celebrated this through Christmas. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He is fully God. He's fully man. At the same time, he is a God-man. He jumped all the way through his life here at this point and says he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He lived in the real world. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. Crucifixion was the means of the Romans' execution, not the Jews. The Jews preferred stoning. Crucifixion was the Roman. He's telling us exactly what happened. He died and was buried. And then it says he descended into hell. Depends which, trans which, which version of this document you follow, but the most ancient seems to say he descended into death, not into hell or Hades. And the whole idea here is when he died, he's, he was in the realm of death. He, he, he was really dead, and he stayed there for some time, three days. He stayed there three days. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. The gospel message does not stop there. He was on the earth and he was witnessed because, you know, 50 days later on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came, but 10 days before that, 40 days later, Jesus ascended into heaven and he was taken up from them. And two men in white shining apparel appeared and said, you men of Galilee, why are you looking up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you, he's going to come back in the same manner in which he left. He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He seated at the right hand of God the Father, Hebrews chapter 1. 
And from there he will come. Oh, as you have seen him go, he's going to come back. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Wow. He goes on. Bob, you might have to click. There, I got it. Okay. He says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Did you get that? There's a big difference here between what it says and what some people believe. It says Holy Catholic Church. It does not say Roman Catholic Church. There's a huge difference. The Roman Catholic Church didn't really come until the Great Schism, the Eastern Orthodox split from the Western Church. Somewhere later, probably about the, what, 10th, 12th century, somewhere in that. Before that, it was just called the Great Church, one big great church, and it was called Catholic. Where Catholic means universal, it takes in the idea of everyone who is saved from the day of Pentecost to the present day. Today, we just call that the body of Christ, the universal church. Here it's called the Holy Universal Church. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Universal Church. I believe in communion of the saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And when I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe in the resurrection of the body. My body, when it dies, I tend to prefer cremation over burial. But you can even bury my ashes. I don't care. I have often told my wife, I just want you to sprinkle my ashes on a table and have everybody come up and put their thumb on it and take a little bit of me with them when they leave. And she always says, I am not doing that. It doesn't matter how you go. You can be swallowed by a fish. You can be swallowed by another fish. Swallowed by another fish. God knows where you are. And in the resurrection, we're going to get a resurrected body. That body's all going to come back. Elements of the other. It's like a seed planted in the earth. You plant it, corrupt it. It comes out incorrupted. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to get a new, resurrected, glorified body like Jesus is. And I believe in everlasting life. Amen. So if someone came to you, and said, what do they teach at your church? This is the Apostles' Creed. Oh, hey, what do they teach at your church about God? Hey, just write it down for me. Just, what, what would you write? What could you say? What would you hear? They were devoted to this teaching. And it's embodied in a simple document like this, a few others. But we have these uh, uh, documents where, where it's been embodied. They had greater devotion they had greater devotion to the apostles' teaching, but they also devoted themselves to fellowship. If there's any area of the church that has suffered in 2020, it is the area of fellowship, koinonia, sharing, participating with one another. There's an expression in the Bible, one another. And I've looked them up. There are 31 different things the Bible commands us to do one to another. You think he can the Ten Commandments is hard? Try doing all 31 of them. I know one for sure you won't do today. Greet one another with a holy kiss. First of all, COVID, you say, I'm staying six feet away. I'm not giving you a holy kiss. And second thing is, I know your kiss won't be holy. <laughs> Maybe slobbery, but it won't be holy. In our culture, it's give us a handshake. You welcome every, every Christian with a handshake. Even now, we don't give a right hand of fellowship. We give the right elbow. We just kind of whack each other with the elbow. Why? Fellowship has suffered the greatest in this past year of any aspect of church life. Any aspect. They devoted themselves to sharing with one another. For some, their fellowship has been by Zoom. For others, it's been by texting, messaging. Others, it's social media. For others, it's sending cards, good old-fashioned cards. 
they're kind of really neat. Because instead of going to the mailbox and just getting bills and ads, <laughs> there's someone who actually cared enough to send you a hard copy. Isn't that something? Yeah, that's something. Fellowship, fellowship. The next one is they were communing. The greater devotion to communing. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and breaking of bread. The word breaking of bread was a term that could be used for any meal, but it was heightened once the Lord consecrated the Lord's Supper. And there were breaking of bread. And in this passage, they wrestle back and forth with the commentators. Are they talking about that they were just eating their meals together? Hey, as a Christian, hey, let's have lunch on Wednesday together. Put that in, put that in, and we'll fellowship at that time. Or are they talking about, they were, every time they got together and they're having a service, they broke bread, because this is new stuff. It's exciting when something is new. They were breaking the bread. They were devoted to it. Devoted to it, he says. And to prayer. They were devoted to prayer. I checked my Greek New Testament on this, which I often do when I study for my message. And it literally says, they devoted themselves to the prayers, plural. Hmm, what prayers could those be? Well, I kind of looked and thought, and I don't think I got them all, but there's a lot of different kinds of prayers in the Bible. First of all, there's praise, adoration, where we sing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Uh, they were adoring him for his holiness. Almighty for his awesome power. And we just, we adore God for who he is. You are my creator. You're my sustainer. You're my provider. You just go down. You rattle off the whole list. You do that to God. That's often overlooked. Jesus starts the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be that holy. That's that word, holy, holy, holy. He addresses God in that really short prayer that anyone can memorize. He, 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 he starts out with adoration, just telling God how great he is. Confession. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Forgive us our debts. Confession. 21st century Christians got a lost art of confession. First of all, we don't want preachers pointing out my sin because that makes me feel uncomfortable. And I don't go to church to feel uncomfortable. I go to church in order to be built up. So don't address sin so that I have to confess it because that makes me feel miserable. And we've lost the art in prayer of confessing our sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You want to feel great about yourself? Spend some time before the Lord confessing. I mean, digging deep. Digging deep. Saying, God, search me. Search my heart. Try me. Examine me. Bring it to my attention. I'll confess it. I'll name it. I'll, I'll admit it. See, when you get up from your knees, if you don't feel like, wow, he's really cleansed and washed my soul. He really has. Then there's petition. This is the one we're really good at. It's called, gimme, 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 God. I want it this way. And then when God really does answer, it's not the way you want it, it's the way he wanted it, because we're supposed to pray according to his will, not my will. And often my will is not his will, so he just says no. And I stop my foot and say, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? Because you didn't pray in my will. You didn't pray in the faith. You didn't meet the qualification. Petition. When your heart is right with God, you petition in the correct way. And God answers that prayer, and you know it. When you don't live your life in the right way, and you don't petition in the right way, you're selfish, you're self-interested, everything revolves around you, and he says, no, he's answered your prayer, and you what? You know it. You know it too. Intercession. That's when you pray for someone else. You're their mediator between God and men, is the man Christ Jesus. Well, you can be the, the mediator between someone and Christ Jesus. 
You pray in behalf of someone else. Thanksgiving. And all things give thanks. Maybe your health's not going in the direction you want. Can you rejoice and give thanks? Maybe your finances aren't going in the direction you want. Can you say thanks? Maybe your front tooth is about to fall out while you're speaking. <laughs> Can you say thanks? Thanks, thanksgiving. Listen, then there's the one that's a lament and a complaint. If you want to see a great one, look up the little book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. It's only three chapters long, and he complains in the first two chapters of it, and then he finally prays in the third chapter of it. You want to look at some psalms of complaint? Look at the 13th psalm. It's a psalm of complaint. They're, 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 it's in the Bible, complaining. You see, God has big enough shoulders to take all your complaints. So instead of taking them to everyone else, why don't you take them to someone who can actually do something about it? Go to the Lord and just complain. There's a couple of psalms where the psalmist is just so totally depressed, he says, why are you cast down, O my soul? Now he's talking to himself in his prayer to God. And he has to remind himself, my hope is in the Lord, my hope is in God. But he's lamenting, he's complaining. The book of Lamentations is Jeremiah, who was told by God to quit praying that God would deliver the people because he's going to judge the people. He's lamenting, he's playing, complaining to the Lord. He's complaining, he's just he's grouchy, he's irritated. Things aren't going my way, and he's praying. But he takes it to the Lord. It's of the Lord's mercies, he finally says, that we are not consumed. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. Even in his complaining, when he takes it to the Lord, he walks away saying, God is so faithful, God is so great, God is so great. Then there are blessings. That's the opposite of lamenting. That's where you bless. You say, bless you. God, you know, I try to end all, like my, all my phone call conversations. Hey, God bless you. I, I want to pronounce the blessing of God upon you, no matter what our conversation. Bless you. It's a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his grace to shine upon you, give you peace. May it be not only to you, but all generations. Amen, amen. Then there are, bless the, the, then there are prayers of vows. Do you know how this works? The vow has an if in it. Some of you might have did this. Lord, if you give me a raise, here's my vow, then, here's the part that's the vow, I will begin tithing. You know how that works. Lord, if you give me a child, then I will raise him for you all the days of my life. That is a prayer of a vow. And as we saw in the book of Ecclesiastes, the fool, it's a fool, who makes a vow and does not pay it. It's better to never have made the vow than to make the vow and not pay it, it says. Don't be a fool. There is a prayer, though, where you say, God, my Sunday school teacher, Wilbur Briel, in a foxhole in France, was shot by the Germans in, the, in his arm, and he prayed in that foxhole. He said, God, if you get me out of here, I will worship and serve you the rest of my life. And I went to his funeral. And everyone from church was there because the rest of his life he fulfilled his vow. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. You could do that. Then there's an imprecatory prayer. We don't talk about these too often. It's not asking God to bless. It's asking God to curse. This is the most popular prayer on planet Earth. You see it in the movies. I hear it on people who don't even believe in God. They'll say, God damn you. You know what they're doing? They're invoking God to bring damnation upon you. That's what they're doing. It's some precatory prayer. You can find them in the Psalms. We've got all these prayers. They were doing all kinds of prayers. And there's a prayer of salvation. And in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 13, it says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What are they saved from? They're saved from their sin. What are they saved to? Eternal life. 
It is a prayer of salvation. Listen, I just listed ten of these, ten of these. I'm telling you what. There was greater devotion among the early believers than those believers before Pentecost during the times of Christ. So that when he said greater things will be done, things, things, one of them was greater devotion. Greater devotion. That brings me to a point where we should pray. Father in heaven, we call ourselves followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps for some of us, our devotion has waned over the years. We are not as hot and on fire as we were when we first came to Jesus. We've allowed the world to lower our temperature, to cool us off. Today, Lord, reignite the fire. We pray that the Holy Spirit will do the greater things in us in 2021 than was done in 2020 or any year before. Lord, I pray that collectively for the church, but it's got to be true for me as an individual and each one in this room. It's got to be our prayer, Lord. May we be more fully devoted to your word, your teaching, to our fellowship, Lord, to communing with one another and having communion. And Lord, to praying. We've outlined ten ways, Lord, we can pray. And if we just did a handful every day, our walk with you would be improved over the years before. Help us, Lord, now to make those vows that we will be different. Having heard from your word, and knowing what to do, and doing it, so that we can see the greater things done in 2021. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.